just to see what I saw in the first two days, and we still had uh, we had more time left than I had ever you know been in the woods probably camping, and it was uh yeah the the views. You swear you go around, you you see a view, then you walk around that mountain, and you see a better view, and this would happen ever, over and over. Just, it was pretty incredible. Episode 342, Kicking Cancer to the Curb and Through Hiking the John Muir Trail with Luke Moore. I believe. I believe that adventure sports will improve your health. I believe that adventure sports will improve your outlook on life. I believe that adventure sports will build community, heal families, and inspire children. I believe that adventure sports will improve this planet. And I believe that adventure is fun. Travis and I created the Adventure Sports Podcast because we believe that adventure sports can make a real difference in this world. The Adventure Sports Podcast creates joy, health, purpose, relationships, memories, and second chances. Do you believe? It is our goal in the new year to double the number of listeners to ASP. Why? To double the good the show is doing. We started this show on the last day of February nearly three years ago. So by the last day of February this year, we will be celebrating double the joy, double the health, double the memories, and double the second chances. This is our challenge to you. Do you believe? Join with us. Tell others about the show. Tell them about the 340 plus episodes of stories, examples, and inspiration. Tell them about this resource that is there for them to explore and encounter. Kickstart their adventure. Kickstart a life. You're listening to the Adventure Sports Podcast, brought to you by 180 Tech. We talk with adventurers from around the globe to bring you the inspiration and motivation you need to get started in the outdoors or to keep you moving if you're already there. Now here's your host, Kurt Linville. Hey, thanks for listening in today. I've got a great show for you. I have Luke Moore on the line, and Luke uh, contacted us with an amazing story that he's going to share today. Luke uh, had to fight leukemia came down with cancer and went through years of struggles with that. But coming out the other side of it, he wanted a major challenge, and he ended up hiking the John Muir Trail. And we've not done a show about the John Muir Trail, and I love the inspiration that Luke has for us today on overcoming and chasing after those dreams. So uh, Luke lives in Iowa, and he is here to tell us all about the John Muir Trail. Luke, welcome to the program. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Happy to be here. Yeah, man, we appreciate it. I think I want to start with hearing about just a little bit about your battle with cancer. Man, it what a scary, scary thing to go through. And if you're willing to share a little bit about that, just a little bit of where you were in life and, and how you found out about it and what transpired, uh, I think that would be a, a really good way to kind of give the backstory for what we're getting ready to talk about. Absolutely. Um I was uh, 25, 24, 25, uh, enrolled at University of Northern Iowa, just doing the whole school thing in there for electronic media, video stuff. And I was just super sick for a long time. I just kept getting fed antibiotics. And uh, I was at work. I, I worked for a uh, heavy machinery company, service and equipment. And I passed out on the workbench and the manager came in and I was like, Oh man, I better get up because this guy's going to be mad at me. And then, uh, he told me go straight to the hospital and, or he's taken me. So that was how I finally knew something was probably wrong. If he didn't get mad and was more caring. <laughs> so I went to the hospital and they kind of found out right there sitting in a room with my girlfriend, wife now that they thought I had cancer, which yeah, it's, still gets hard to talk about but so we found out then and my parents came up and we started that battle which was kind of a relief in itself because I had been so sick and we finally knew now what it was and we could go after it and try you know get everything fixed back up so did that for a year then uh it was 
seven days a week, 24 hours a day. I think I'd sit five or six treatments of where you're hooked up to chemo. Take it wherever you go. It's for seven days a week, 24 hours a day. You live with it, eat with it, shower with it. Wow. Um, so did that about six times. And then it, it's, it's the whole overall took about a year. Um, throughout that time, I, I had been a, I've loved Colorado forever. I started skiing there when I was four years old, always wanted to live in the mountains. And we got done with that. And I said, this is like, let's go, let's move to mountains. So we moved out to Steamboat Springs, uh, Colorado for a year. My wife interned. Um, I pretty much celebrated that I was alive, right. fly fished and snowboarded every day I could. <laughs> so I love the Yampa too. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, and yeah, then, yep. Yeah, so that was that far. Um, I can keep going cause it ended up, um, the good story kind of came to an end again. Uh, we found out in Colorado that we, we were going to be expecting a, a little baby girl, um, so we decided we better kind of get our adult life together and we moved back to Iowa and I started working for the family business again there. And Amanda was trying to figure out what she was going to do for her career. Uh, we went up to Rochester, Minnesota for a checkup. Uh, we had a weekend plan for camping and fly fishing It stopped in real quick. And I was like, this thing's going to be in and out. Um, you know, I was, I felt great. I'd been in the mountains for the last year hiking, biking, fishing, I mean, doing everything but working. So I was feeling good, uh, mentally good, everything good. And the doctor came in and she was tears in her eyes crying. And I remember mm. at that moment, I was like, oh, I felt bad for her. I was like, oh man, hopefully, you know, she's all right. And then like, it hit me with a ton of bricks. I was like, this is not her, this is me. Wow. So we left and yeah, and then, uh, called my parents on the way home, made that phone call. And so, yeah, we were, I was sick again and my wife was pregnant or girlfriend at the time, wife now, sorry. Um, so we went back to the campground and let all that soak in for a bit and made some phone calls and just tried to get ready for round two. Oh, that sounds so tough. And so was round two like round one? No, round two, I didn't know if I was going to make it through that one. <laughs> the, the stem cell was, it was real, not, not stem cell. Um, the prep was rough on me, a lot of radiation, a lot of chemo. I went in there probably about 173 pounds, was never a very big guy, but I came out of there just about 105, so 110 tops. It beat me down real bad, and then the stem cell uh, side effects, with the GBHD, the graft versus disease was extremely brutal on me. I don't, I don't make any tears anymore. I, I can't, I can do everything physically in crying, but I can't produce tears. Wow. And scarring around joints. And if I fell on the ground, I wouldn't even be able to get up. It was nothing bent. My wrist didn't bend. My knees didn't bend. Nothing would, nothing would work. That was one hot mess. So let's just unpack this a little bit so the listeners understand. So the way to fight against leukemia sometimes is what you had to do as a stem cell replacement transplant. So they essentially blast your own stem cells throughout your body, right? They, they try to wipe out the cancerous ones, and then they give you new ones, and uh, it's supposed to rebuild. Am I right? Right, right. Yep. So they'll kill off. They blast you and blast you. Uh, and they kill off all of the, the good, or the, excuse me, the bad cells. Well, it kills actually all the cells because your immune system goes to zero. So infects your high risk for infection or of getting extremely ill if you get an infection because your body has nothing to fight it. So then they all, they replace my bone marrow with a bone marrow donor. And that's as simple as uh, a bag of what looks like kind of diluted blood was what mine looked like. It's kind of pink and it's literally a drip blood infusion. And you, a nurse sits there with you to, to monitor it because it can kind of go either way at that point. It can still reject right away or go fine. And luckily mine went fine on the, when I actually received it. So the idea is that the bone marrow then gets into your bones and uh, it, 
is supposedly going to take hold and become your new bone marrow, but your body rejected it somewhere down the road. Yeah, it started rejecting it. And actually, rejection is good, I was told. Uh, it can give you uh, some medication to kind of slow the rejection down, but it enhances the chance of the cancer coming back. So I was, I was like, I'm not given any chances for that happening again. So I just dealt with it. I was purple for like a year. People would ask me like, why are you so dirty? And to me, I didn't really know I was that purple at the time. I looked at <laughs> photos and I was like, oh my gosh, I did look terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I was standing in Walmart and a lady asked me why I was so dirty. I'm like, I, just, I literally just showered. I'm going out. Like me and Amanda were going out for dinner or something. And I, I was like, oh, it's because my face is purple. <laughs> wow. So yeah, it was, it was pretty brutal. And I, I, I'm sure everybody's experience is different. I, I've met people that have had their own bone marrow and it wasn't quite like that, but I don't know. Mine was not good to me. Oh, it was great to me. I'm alive. That's, yeah. I shouldn't say that at all. So how long did this go on before you got your health back? Well, when I was fully like feeling a hundred percent physical health back, are you talking? Well, at what point, I guess, did you feel like that you could do things again and you started dreaming about going out on the big hike? So it was probably a couple of years after I got my stem cell. My first year, the first year after I was, I was bad, I couldn't see, they couldn't figure out what was wrong with my eyes. And lo and behold, it was only that they didn't make tears. So we removed all of my tear ducts. So when I blink, I don't lose any of the little bit my body does create. So mm-hmm. I use a lot of artificial tears. So then we finally got that figured out and figured out the problem. And that took, that took, my gosh, almost a year and a half. I couldn't even drive. I couldn't see street lights. My oh, eyes were wow. so dry and it, it didn't matter what I did. So then I finally started working about two years after, maybe a year and a half after, uh, kind of another funny story. My old place of work every Friday, they'd have a meeting and have somebody in that was inspirational, motivating, etc. And they had uh, a fitness trainer in there giving a speech but this fitness trainer I used to work out with in college when I got diagnosed and hadn't seen him since. So that was pretty cool. He didn't even recognize me. I was in such bad shape. And I, I went up to, I was like, Armin, he was like, he said, who the, are you? I was like, then I told him, he goes, Oh my God, I thought you were dead. <laughs> I was like, Not yet. <laughs> but yeah. So then he, uh, went to CrossFit gym and I won't get into the whole CrossFit stuff, but that literally saved my life doing mm. CrossFit. So that's when, that's when I started two years after, probably wasn't until about four years after that I was really starting to feel like I was getting some muscle back and becoming the old me physically. So and now I'm in the best shape I've ever been in my entire life. <laughs> wow. So how long do you think you've been back? Say it that way. Um, I've probably fully been back to 100% health for probably three years now. Congratulations. You know, it's it's such a tragedy when someone has to go through such a chronic illness like that. And, you know, you, you give us the bullet points and we can kind of imagine, oh, that must have been tough. But I know it was, you know, exponentially worse than we imagine it was. And, uh, man, I'm sorry you had to go through all that. That's just tough. Yep, yep. But there's no, no back, no saying no. You just got to go through it. Mm. So then you set your sights on the John Muir Trail and what, what led you to, to think about doing that? It was a, a buddy of mine that I've known my entire life. Uh, me and him actually hiked it. His name is Michael. He started working with a, Above and Beyond Cancer. It's a group in Iowa that they do. They take these cancer survivors on journeys. They summited Mount Kilimanjaro last summer. I mean, they nice. do amazing stuff. And I've done some trips. Yeah, I've done some trips with them. Um, he introduced me to them. So i had been listening to some podcasts, yours, was a big one and a couple other outdoor ones were kind of all over the board people backpacking just being outdoors doing some pretty cool stuff and then michael had hiked to uh the base camp of mount everest and so he was kind of fully into backpacking and i mentioned something to him that i wanted to said hey let's let's do a trip kind of feeling like i needed to get back a few parts of me that maybe had been taken away through the beat down I had received from the hospital. So we kind of talked back and forth and he sent some info over on the GMT and I started looking at photos and kind of reading reviews and 
I was like, wow, if, if we can get the permits, let's, let's do it. So he started filing per, for permits. I did too, and faxing them in and lo and behold, we got them. So I was actually down in Virginia for a wedding and then, uh, flew out early Sunday morning out to California and we met up and took a train up to up North there. I think it was Merced. I'm kind of forget names, but, um, Made it to Yosemite and was riding that bus in, looking at those granite walls. I was like, oh my gosh, what did I get myself into? <laughs> so, <laughs> I've never seen anything like that. That was pretty beautiful. So that's how it began. Wow. Well, at this point, let's share just a little bit about the John Muir Trail for the listeners so they know what we're getting ready to talk about here. Absolutely. Um, I looked up some of the stats on it. I've not done the John Muir Trail. I've read a lot of the stuff that John Muir wrote. I've also looked at tons of Ansel Adams photographs, which is also a part of the John Muir Trail. But I have never been on it. I have been to Yosemite and Sequoia, and that's also a part of the John Muir Trail. I mean, what trail in <laughs> yeah. the United States goes through some of the most amazing land in the whole nation? You know, So it's 215 miles long, starts in Yosemite. And it, then it goes through Ansel Adams Wilderness. Then it goes through Sequoia National Park. And then Kings Canyon. And it ends on top of the highest mountain in the lower 48, Mount Whitney. And so, man, what an amazing trip. 215 miles. Now, you said earlier that you were thinking maybe it would be a, you know, a three or four or five day trip. But how long did this take? Uh, that took us 18 days. 18 days. So you, you roll into Yosemite and you're like, uh oh. <laughs> I, I rolled into Yosemite looking as Iowan as you possibly could look with the white face, all the new gear. Everybody's like, oh no, what's this kid going to do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty, pretty intimidating uh, actually arriving, picking up permits listening to the park rangers about bears and i was like i have never in my life camped around a bear <laughs> so i was that was the, my my biggest fear yeah it was just i was just i don't know why i was always afraid of it but i definitely was always nervous of that of bears yeah you know what it, bears the, the stories that hollywood has put out about bears which are not even true you know fictitious but yeah bears have uh captured the the fearful imaginings i think of americans for for generations and what we find out is that bears aren't nearly as dangerous as uh, they're made out to be but they're still really big intelligent powerful mammals with long claws so you know y you have to exactly you have to know what you're doing right we sat down and they completely tell the guy asked me he said you've heard backpack before i looked at him i said nope <laughs> he's like he's like really <laughs> So he was a little shocked, and I, I told I was asking a lot of questions, and then asked us about some bear stuff. Been in the those woods for twenty plus years, and she said all they are is big raccoons. I was like, I know raccoons. We got a lot of raccoons in Iowa, so that's what I thought about the whole time is big raccoons. <laughs> there proved you go. pretty, proved pretty true. So it's official. Winter has arrived, and Bent Gate Mountaineering is prepared to help you get ready for your epic winter. Come check out the latest in Alpine Touring, Telemark, NTN, and Splitboarding gear. They have brands like Black Crows, DPS, Dinafit, G3, Icelandic, K2, Technica Blizzard, Arcteryx, Mammoth, Solomon, Vole, Never Summer, Jones, and BCA. And you do need to be safe out there. Bentgate has the latest in avalanche safety gear. They have beacons, airbags, shovels, and probes, and they're ready to help you educate yourself on snow safety. They also rent out gear, so you can get your skis and your boots there, as well as your avalanche safety equipment. What's more, they also have free demo ski days at local resorts, so you can try out the latest gear. Now, how much fun does that sound? So swing by Bent Gate in Golden, Colorado, or go to BentGate.com to find your new gear, as well as to get updates on all of their events.
So Luke, since this was your first time backpacking, you're in Yosemite, you're, you're uncertain about the wildlife, you see these huge walls all around you. Was it intimidating when you took off? Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. And then the rattlesnake that went by my tent the, uh. the night before, or the day before, didn't help me. I, I didn't even know there were rattlesnakes. <laughs> wow. Well, that's the first. <laughs> nah, it was, so, yeah, it was uh, that first day... I didn't know what I should be doing. We were carrying way too much food, way too much water. It was a brutal first day, but it was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen walking up to that first fall and just looking over the valley. That was like, that was pretty amazing. I'll never forget that ever. I'll never forget that trip, but that was a pretty cool moment. So was that the moment when you you, you kind of said, okay, I think I can do this? Yeah, there was, there was a lot of uncertainty Day one, I mean, not, I shouldn't say a lot, but I was still trying to figure things out. I was still trying to kind of calm down a little bit. I was getting anxiety a little bit of, uh, you know, this is going to be pretty, pretty intense. And then I was getting pretty gassed because we were way overpacked. So that first day was brutal. I, I told my buddy, Michael, I was hiking with that next morning. I said, had there been a bus stop, I would have been <laughs> on it. <laughs> but... Luckily, there wasn't because it got a lot better as we went. So Wow. So uh, I want to hear just kind of a rundown of how the trail went. But before we do, you mentioned you're overpacked. So if you were to do the trip again now, what would you leave home? Well, we, we packed, uh, well, a little fishing gear and whatnot that actually met some amazing trail people. They sent it back to my house for me. Uh, we, we carried way too much food for the first two days. I didn't know you carry supply in 12 meadows. The second day, I had food for nine days. Um, the water, we carried way too much water all the time. Just so like that, I, I would definitely hone in a little better on, you know, where the water's at. I had maps of where the water was at, but didn't know how accurate they were for late August. Definitely the food and water, make sure you have the right amount. Not too little. I don't believe that was a bad deal, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt. So how was the second day? The second day was great. Uh, slept at really good. Um, we walked into this beautiful meadow. I mean, this, the sights were amazing. I had the right weight food. I had the right weight water, a bunch of education for our next day. It was it, next day was a great day, but th- that was when my uh, tendonitis, I believe, my knee started acting up the second day. Uh-oh. About mid end of the second day, it was it was stinging pretty good, uh, like in the middle of my kneecap and on the side of my knee. So it ended kind of bad, but uh, not bad, not bad. Uh, just I was hoping that would go away. But yeah, it was a beautiful campsite, camped right under the pass, and we bathed in the river for the first time i'd done that and cleaned up made some dinner and slept pretty well that night as well all right so two days into the trail what do you think about it are you are you now saying i'm a backpacker for life or are you saying i'm not so sure oh yeah i was on board at that time walking out of tolamine i was uh i was like this is this is pretty cool to be able to just to see what i saw on the first two days and we still had we had more time left than I had ever, you know, been in the woods, probably camping. And it was, uh, yeah, the, the views, you swear you go around, you, you see a view, then you walk around that mountain and you see a better view. And this would happen ever, over and over. Just, it was pretty incredible. I've mentioned to people in the past that just love visiting Colorado, that what you see from the car is, is, you know, it's impressive. It's amazing. But they put the roads where the roads were easy to put, which means they didn't put the roads where the views were the best, right? Absolutely. To get out there, I mean, to get off, I shouldn't say the beaten path because the JMT is pretty popular, but to get out there where there isn't cars, the only thing you see is an airplane and see those views that are hidden out there in the mountains is a pretty pretty life-changing thing. It, it, it kind of instills in it and for me, now I have to keep seeing stuff like that. <laughs> you know what I really love about visiting with you about this is that we're getting the perspective of someone who just started doing it. And I think that's so fresh and so refreshing, you know. 
I, I think this is awesome. And and that's really what it's like. When you go backpacking for the first time, you go to a great destination, you take off. I mean, it's kind of like, oh, this is hard work. I'm not sure if I did this right and all that kind of stuff. But then pretty soon it turns into, I have never experienced anything like this in my life. This is amazing. Yep, absolutely. I was very nervous doing it. I, and like I said, I've been outside. I've camped a lot. But that, I mean, it, it goes a little bit with it. But I'm not saying anybody should just go out and climb Everest on their first day of thought. But at some point, you got to go. You can just talk and prep and talk and prep. But at some point, you actually got to go do it if you're ever going to actually sleep in the woods or see those beautiful destinations, not by car. Yeah, you have to at some point actually do it. Step out the door and do it. (laughs) Yep. You're two days in now. Do you know at this point, are you still in Yosemite or have you hit Ansel Adams Wilderness by now? Oh my goodness. I'd, you know, I I couldn't even tell you. I'd have to look at my notes to see exactly where we were at. That's pretty bad, but I, no I journaled along the way. Thank, thank goodness, because I go back and I haven't looked at it for about a month or two, but I can sit there and read that journal and it puts me back to the exact place. And then I have photos of each spot where I journaled. So it's, um, but I'm not exactly sure what days we were into what forest. I knew we were there. We'd look at the map and, and wow, we're in a, this is uh, the second national forest we're in. So yeah, they're just artificial boundaries, aren't they? Yep. You know, but as you hike, the landscape changes. How about, how about we do this? Tell us about the John Muir Trail. Um, how the landscape changes as you travel through it. Just kind of give us the overview. That would be awesome. Yeah, it, it's quite incredible. Like leaving Yosemite, just these huge granite walls, and everything's a lot of granite. Trail's a little slippery with sand and granite. And then you get into, I think between uh, after Tuolumne, it gets real sandy. It might have been a, a day or two after, maybe two days after Tuolumne, real sandy and desert-like. Yeah, then, you know, there's a lot of green spaces. You're getting a lot of water, but a lot of rock, a lot of the, the desert areas were kind of interesting where it was just dry. But definitely every national or, or every park had its different mm. imaginary line, but definitely a, a visual of you, you saw it slowly changing into something else. So when you got to the sequoias, were you hiking through the the massive giant trees? Yeah, they were big. I, I had pictured, uh, honestly, bigger trees. Like, cause I I grew up seeing it on TV where cars are driving through it. But they were monster trees. But none that uh, maybe I guess you could put a smaller car through them. But large trees. And then we we walked through an area. That I think it was Sequoias where a big uh, they had a 150 mile an hour winds come through there earlier of the year or might have been the year before and it blew down i mean trees and the roots were the size of small houses sticking out of the ground it was quite incredible to see the power that's out there and if you had potentially witnessed it how terrifying that could have been (laughs) oh man yeah when i visited sequoia i was just blown away that i my mind couldn't understand what i was looking at the trees were so big but they weren't supposed to be that big because I'd never seen anything like that before. You know, your mind tries to tell you that a tree is a given size, but these were so big, yeah. you couldn't even understand how big, big was. I mean, trees as big as skyscrapers, you know? Yeah. Um, and I well, don't know if that was a part of the park that you got to go through or not, but it sounds like you saw some really big ones, even if it wasn't. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. They were some large trees, but I don't think they were the, as large as uh, the one you're describing. Mm, wow. Well, I, uh, I, I just love trees, and I love Sequoia because of that. It's just such a beautiful place. What about Kings Canyon? What was that like? Uh, it's honestly so hard to differentiate in my mind uh, with, without looking at my photos of which is which. There isn't a bad spot on that trail. Every place you camp is the most beautiful place you've ever seen in your life. You're, every lake is incredible, they, and they, they're they all change in temperatures. You'd swear you're higher at this one, so it's going to be colder. And I, I always didn't think that was always the case. I always thought the water was every river you laid in was different. Every lake you laid in was different. All very cold, but I always thought there. It might have just been me, I guess, and how hard I was whooped that day. Then some felt colder than others. But 
it's it, it's really hard for me to differentiate the the difference in the parks. Mm. Well, let's go to Mount Whitney. Whitney was uh, I remember seeing a sign when we're about thirty miles away, and I was I was so excited. I hadn't talked to my wife at that time for about ten days. Uh, Another thing I, I, I wouldn't recommend is we didn't go out with any um, bot or any um, GPS device, which I, when I go back to anywhere, that I won't make that mistake again. But luckily, I ran into somebody the day when I saw that sign, Whitney. The first time I saw anything that said Mount Whitney that I remember is the day I talked to my wife on uh, a text. I just ran into a guy, uh, let me use his his sat phone to text Amanda. I just said, we're okay. <laughs> and I said, yeah, that was pretty cool. So <laughs> then I saw the sign for Whitney and I was like, Oh my gosh, this is, and like, I was pretty pumped up at that time. We had a few days left, but then I remember seeing Whitney for the first time walking through this weird desert area. It looked like it had been flooded at one time and looked like there had been islands on top of mountains, bizarre area. Uh, then I look over and just see this monster, Whitney, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, we're going to be there. I'm like, it's that's the end, but you kind of loop around, and I think it was two or two days after we finally, or three days after we were finally on top of it. Wow. So it was, it was incredible. You know, I said before we started recording, we got to talk about this. A lot of people in Colorado are kind of miffed about Mount Whitney. And it's because <laughs> Mount Whitney is 63 feet higher than Mount Elbert. And everybody in Colorado wants Mount <laughs> Elbert to be the highest peak in the lower 48. But Mount Whitney's got it spanked by 63 little feet. So yep. <laughs> it, it's all in good fun. But I'm telling you, man, if you're climbing any 14er, it's a job, especially if you have a full pack. And uh, a lot of the base area around Whitney is pretty down low. So you have a lot of vertical feet, too. What was it like trying to get to the top of that thing? Well, let me go back like a day before we, we finally, or quickly, two days before we hit Whitney. Me, my beginner backpacking and my poor planning, I was nearly out of food. I had, uh, for two days, I was riding, bought a, a granola bar. I had a breakfast, a granola bar, and a dinner. Um, and as you probably know, that's not a whole lot of food when you're no. cranking out calories all day. So <laughs> that I was hurts. In, I, was in pretty, I was in pretty rough shape for and nobody else wanted to give up their food either, obviously. And I wasn't asking for it. I kind of knew. <laughs> so luckily we ran into some firefighters. Oh, my gosh. And uh, another couple that they came up to us and like, hey, we have uh, way too much food. Anybody want some? Whoa. So, yeah, it happened two days in a row. So I was ecstatic, felt so great. We got to the night before we're going to summit Whitney. We got into camp at about 12 p.m. And uh, these firefighters walk by and they keep bringing us food. They just keep bringing food and keep bringing food. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and I hadn't, I hadn't eaten <clears throat> like a lot of food for probably five or six days. I was kind of you know, I'm not a real full belly. I was always kind of hungry. So I sat from 12 till seven, got up one time to get more water, to cook more food. And <laughs> ate. That's all I did was eat. <laughs> we got up at three in the morning. I'm not exactly two or three in the morning to go summit Whitney. And I couldn't move. I was the worst I'd ever felt on that trail, <laughs> that entire trip. I, I hit a wall about the first hour and I was just struggling to get up, but I wasn't, I mean, obviously I was not quitting at that point and we pressed on. We, at that time we were hiking with about four other people and they were very supportive and helped each other get up the way. And that going up Whitney on the backside uh, at night, that was interesting too. Pretty loose rock trail and a long ways down on, one side of you it's just sometimes both sides of you if you don't do it right but yeah it was it was a battle we got up there right before right before we sat probably 20 minutes before the sun was coming up and sat there and just bathed in our glory of watching the sun come up with all of our new friends we met on the trail and celebrated it was amazing wrote my name down in the book and i was so happy to go 
to start heading down to start making my trip back to Iowa and see the the kids uh, and my wife. So, but then yeah, that was uh, ten miles back down or so. So that was a ninety nine switchback on the back on um, going down Whitney. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that that oh. had to be a major feat, and what a wonderful thing to get to watch the sunrise from a place like that. Wow. Good for you. Yeah, it, it was pretty amazing. I think the, probably one of the highlights of the end were going down the trail and everybody asking, like, how did you guys summit Whitney already? I'm like, this is my 18th day. I'm like, there was, so I was, people, you know, we were hugging strangers. And I was like having the time <laughs> of my life going down. Everybody's like, no way. I'm like, this is amazing. And then, then I'd ask about news, you know, because I, you know, I asked about a couple of things that I was curious about. So it was kind of funny getting the news from people walking up to Summit Whitney. And I was like, oh, no way. That's, that's, you know, it was just interesting. Been offline for a bit. It was, it was nice. It was great. Everybody should do it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so in the end, did it work? You said that you were nervous that life had started, things that shouldn't be scaring you started scaring you, and, and you just felt like you had to break out of that trap. And so you did a much bigger trip than you originally expected to. In the end, did it work? Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. That, that, that trail changed more parts of me than just exploring. You know, that, is, that was a big one, and, you know, just my desire now, like, that I have to get my kids and my wife out on that trail, not saying to do the whole trail, but to do some parts of it just to get out and see those areas, not by car or not even on a day's walk. It is magical places that exist. And then to be able to just sit there in your tent and look out and see it is absolutely life changing. I mean, it, my desire to now keep doing stuff is, uh, yep. I got to, we got to keep seeing those beautiful places. So, and I want my my kids and my wife to go with me and like be able to impact them as much as impacted me. Mm. So that's so cool, man. And I can tell you from experience that as your kids get big enough to do bigger and bigger things, and you get to do it with them, it's it's like you are doing it for the first time all over again because you get to see the the fascination and the joy on their faces and kind of live their experience a little bit too. So you have a lot to look forward to. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I guess I didn't say throughout all that cancer stuff, we ended up having a, a baby boy that was never supposed to happen. Uh, we were told and that happened. So if two kids, an eight year old and a three year old boy and a girl, and uh, things are great now, healthier than I've ever been. Actually, I've, I've really focused on, you know, being active, being outside, and, and my kids are the same. They, I, they're definitely mine. You can't keep them inside. We live on an <laughs> acre, and they're, uh, they're not inside at all. <laughs> That's great. Well, what would you say to someone who just found out that he or she has cancer, that they have that rough row to hoe ahead of them? Uh, any advice? Yeah, I mean, I've I've spoke to a few people, you know, my age and older uh, that I've known through friends and sent some emails, phone calls and whatnot. Um, it's, you know, it's not the end by any means. I, I've been through some dark times and kind of wondered, you know, would I ever be able to do anything again? Hence why I wanted to do that trail. It's not the end. Everything that happens to you, you know, you can get back, you can keep moving forward. You can live a healthy life again. Just, you got to keep your head up and surround yourself with good people and move forward. That's it one foot in front of another and don't stop. Man, I love it. That's awesome. Do you think that it helps to set some big goals and have something to look forward to? Yeah, that definitely drives me. I like to have uh, a big goal set and then some small ones in between, you know, and those small ones are usually overnight trips, like with outdoor stuff with the family or maybe not even camping, just going to a new place with, with the family, with me and my kids, my wife and, and then uh, definitely having that big goal set that kind of pushes me. So I'm kind of I don't know what I'm prepping for now, but I'm getting into the shape where I I, I think I can do something big again. Where it, I, I'll feel much better than I did uh, two years ago. So. Right on, right on. 
Well, what about the John Muir Trail? The JMT, you said it's it's a fairly busy trail. Do you know about how many people are on it, or what, how many people did you bump into along the way? Uh, we ran into, gosh, we'd run into somebody, usually about once a day, maybe two, two different groups, maybe once a day. Pretty busy. That's probably the reason why, too, we, I didn't have a GPS. I mean, again, not saying that's a good idea. I, I wouldn't ever do it again. But I knew there would be some people out there. You you can still find some solitude, absolutely. You don't have to camp where there's a tent. There's plenty of tent sites that you can use and be by yourself. And definitely uh, definitely some quiet time out there. And uh, the permit system, how how difficult was it to get the permit for your thru-hike? Uh, extremely difficult, we were told to get. We didn't have much of a problem getting it. We faxed in each of us maybe five, six different times. And then my buddy Michael got them. But when we went to get the permits, people tell us, you don't know how lucky you are to have these. And we knew they're a rarity, but everybody we told that we had a full Yosemite Mount Whitney, they're like, you guys do not know how lucky you are. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. We have the whole thing. And, you know, I didn't, the whole time when I was out there, I'd tell my buddy, ignorance is bliss. Because had I known how bad some of that some of those days would hurt, it would been a tough sell. But, <laughs> so that was just ignorance. I didn't know I didn't know how rare they were, but I, I definitely didn't take it for granted either. They were it was I enjoyed it. I thank God it's there. It's a beautiful place. Well, is it a lottery system that you guys just happened to get the luck of the draw? Is that how it worked? Yeah, so you fax in six months before, send it to uh their office is right in Yosemite Valley there and they, from what I've been told, I haven't seen the process, they shuffle the papers up and draw, I don't know how many out a day, but it's just a lottery. So, luck of the draw. Mm, wow. Well, good for you guys. And you know what? You deserved it. Absolutely, man. It couldn't have fallen to a better guy, that someone that would benefit more from it, you know, than yourself. So, I am I just think that's awesome, the way that that all worked out. Matter of fact, in your story, there were several times there that things went amazingly right you had a lot of tough stuff, but things went yeah. amazingly right, and uh, that's just awesome. Yep, yep. It's to that, how all that fell fell together is uh, pretty unbelievable. I mean, from the planning, from the saying yes to the start, and actually coming down the Lone Pine at the end. That was and my buddy's girlfriend who flew out to Lone Pine and rented a car and picked us up. Uh, I mean, the pieces that fell together. Were in my wife to let me go that long <laughs> with two kids at home. <laughs> so yeah, it was a uh, it was pretty incredible. How I, I, I'm extremely thankful that that trip happened, and, yeah. and I that'll be. We were having a horrible day one day, just beat down, and I yell up to my buddy. I was like, Michael. I was like, This will be the greatest adventure we ever tell, buddy. We got to finish it. <laughs> so we'd always say that. Like right now is the greatest adventure I could ever tell. So that might not be the case forever, but right now it is. Yeah. You know, we might be smack dab in the middle of winter these days, but spring is really just right around the corner. Make sure you've got one of our lightweight camp stoves ready to go in your pack for when the weather starts turning warmer. Both the 180 stove and the 180 flame are designed to burn the abundant wood fuels you find on the ground instead of requiring you to haul in heavy, messy camp fuels. Take a minute to head on over to our site at www.180tack.com to check out these American-made stoves that are built to last. You'll be helping us, and you'll be helping the Adventure Sports Podcast. Thanks, guys. Well, I tell you what, to get the opportunity to backpack through those areas, that really is a treat. Those are some of the most popular uh, national parks and wilderness areas in the United States. And I want to mention to our listeners, for people that haven't backpacked yet that may not know, there are untold thousands of places where you can do this, places that don't even require a permit. And the reason is because they're places that aren't used very much. They're unknown. They're hidden treasures. And uh, even just in Colorado alone, 
I, I don't know, 10 lifetimes wouldn't be enough to do it all. So being able to do the JMT, man, that's a real treat. But I have to mention to you guys, you know, you pick a route in a wilderness area, you find a way that you want to go in a, a lake or a destination or a through hike. And most of these places, you contact the Forest Service, you say what's required, and they say, have fun, be safe. You know, there's a big world out there with amazing things to see and to do. It may not be Sequoia National Park or Yosemite, but you'll see things that are just mind-blowing and and beautiful no matter where you go. It's just a matter of being out there. Yep, you got to get out. Very, very cool. At least if it's on your mind, you got to get out there. Would you describe for us... An experience on the JMT that was like your best experience or something really good? Oh, the best experience out there? I would probably, I mean, I'd have to say I was nearly exhausted coming up Whitney. I think it was my overindulging for a solid afternoon. <laughs> uh, and then seeing, seeing that hut, I was like, oh my God, we're here. Thank god we're here and now and i knew it was a bittersweet moment i was so happy i was so happy that i was gonna be able to that day talk to my wife and kids on the phone that was and that it, we did it through the whole for 15 days my knee hurt so bad twice i had to get carried to camp down a hill and we just kept pressing on uh i mean i, I could go in a but to get to finish it to get to the top that was uh it was amazing. It was about as good as rolling in Yosemite Valley, how excited and nervous and everything else I was. Mm-hmm. Beginning and end, those were, those were pretty amazing. That's great. And do you have a, a story about when things went terribly wrong that you'd like to share? Yeah, luckily nothing went like terribly wrong uh, where anybody was risking serious injury. I, I like I said, had, I was dealing with a knee issue. And we were before at nine days, we, we were close to the John Muir, uh, trail ranch. So we were one day before that. And I had been battling my knee for a few days. It'd be pretty good. Most of the day and in the afternoon, it, it, it'd get real bad. And, uh, I laying out on a rock and this guy comes by and he was talking to me about campsites. And I, he said, how's your day going? And out there, I kind of learned like, you literally tell how your day is going because that person might be able to help you out or you might be able to help that person out with sure. something. Like my knee, is, my knee has been killing me. He's oh, come down to my tent a little bit. We got a physical therapist. He can take a look at it. <laughs> right like, on. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. So I go down there and he gives me an exam. I lay on a rock and he's feeling my telekiniscus and IT band and He's like, there, he goes, I just think some tendonitis there. He goes, I don't think anything's torn. He goes, obviously, you know, it's not an x-ray, but the way it was moving. So I asked him because I was like, I was in some serious pain. I knew I could get out if I had to at the trail ranch. Didn't want to at all, but it, it was getting pretty bad. And I had a lot of ibuprofen in me trying to, you know, mask it. So I was like, it, what can happen? You know, he goes, well, really nothing long-term. He goes, it'll hurt seriously bad. And he's, don't let this, you know, fool you. It takes a lot of people out for, you know, knee pain. But I decided we had a, we got a knee brace at Trail Ranch. So I was pretty bummed at that point. Like just uh, mentally, I wanted to finish and, you know, I was hurting pretty bad. And then things kept adding up. I lost a couple things. I lost my bandana and that was like my life tool, cleaning <laughs> and shade and everything. I, I was in, I was in rough shape. I remember I did a video log and I was nearly crying because I, it, it just felt terrible. My bandana was gone. <laughs> <laughs> it was, you know, like these little things. But that was at my worst time. That was about right in the middle of the trip. A couple of days after the trail ranch, I was, that was my lowest point. I was just sitting by myself in a river, just doing a blog, pitying myself. Had a little pity party. <laughs> so, but next day I woke up, though, I felt good mentally and everything. And, uh, the knee pain would always go away in the morning and come back in the afternoon every day. So I, it was manageable. Then it's pressed on. So. Right on. Well, way to overcome and persevere, man. <laughs> and what a reward. And the bandana thing. I am with you, dude. People 
that haven't used a bandana in the woods don't realize how handy that is. I take a bandana. Oh. I'll take an extra one with me. I don't ever want to be without a bandana when I'm backpacking. It does so much. Absolutely. I will never backpack again without two. Funny part of the story is I hike for three days, ask everybody on the trail. I'm literally trying to, well, you know, money doesn't really mean stuff when you're out there, but I'm trying to buy uh, bandanas off their, <laughs> their heads. And I'm like, I will buy that for me. And they're like, no way. You got any food? I'm like, no, I don't have any food. But, uh, so we just passed on for like three, you know, three days. I'm not kidding you. I walk up and there is a bandana sitting on a rock. I, the stars aligned. I was smile. I was laugh. Oh my gosh. I couldn't believe it. And the whole group was like, there's a bandana, Luke. And, they're like, we don't know where it's been. I'm like, I don't even care where it's been. I'll rinse it and use it. <laughs> like, <laughs> that it is was... so great. That's hilarious. Yeah. So what is what what makes a bandana so so good for you? Oh my god, the, I love. Well, I'd clean my face with so it. Clean, you know, clean up everything. Do dishes with. I mean, I, I use that thing for everything. I don't know if it's proper for backpacking, but. And the biggest thing I loved it for, I put it under my. I wore a baseball cap. I put it under my baseball cap real hot days and I just use it for shade. So it's always kept me shaded. And then I, you know, put in a river and put it on my head, put my baseball cap back on. You know, it was, I love that thing. I still, I still have the the one I found. So that's the new one. <laughs> yeah. I, I'd like sometime to make a list of all the ways that I've used a bandana back ta- backpacking. I mean, people are going to laugh that we're talking about a bandana like this, but it is the handiest thing. If you're a backpacker and you haven't taken a bandana with you yet, <laughs> It's sunscreen. Oh, yeah. It's it's bug repellent, right? Yeah. You can use it as yeah, a sunscreen bug repellent. You can wash dishes with it. You can use it as a hot pad to handle hot things, right? You can use yeah. it to uh, do first aid, right? Yep. You can use it to wash That's up good. with. You can use it as as air conditioning, like you described. Get the thing wet, tie it around your neck, or put it under your hat. Yep. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. If you have to honk your nose in the middle of the night, you have something right there. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, and for people, it might, I mean, to me, before I went backpacking, I'm like, that sounds like a lot of use for one rag. But when you're out there for that long, uh, dirty is dirty. There isn't like dirtier or dirty. It's just dirty. So <laughs> yeah, you wash it. You care. keep going, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. I'm like, it, it was an amazing trip and I'm extremely thankful that I was able to, uh, a, to be healthy enough to do it and actually end up doing it. Yeah. What a beautiful story, man you're going through cancer and all of that and then in the end you're standing on top of mount whitney watching the sunrise persevered with tendonitis and all sorts of stuff it's it's a good story so what's on the horizon what kind of adventures are you hoping for in the future uh i I think i want to do a kayaking adventure um this coming summer we have a nice river that's kind of a iowa adventure just kind of explore kind of want to kayak from cedar falls over to the Mississippi River, about an hour and a half straight drive. So I'm not exactly sure how long that would take me to do. It's kind of one of those up in the air things. Imagine quite a while, but that's kind of I want to do a, a kayaking adventure. That sounds so, like nine days. Yeah, yeah. I, we got a lot of twists and turns, and the rivers don't move very fast, and it depends on the rain as well. But obviously, you know. But yeah, so that's kind of what I was thinking around there, not seven to ten days, but. <laughs> that's, that's awesome probably the next one right on and yep. it's so important i think to always have something to reach for you know something to look forward to keep doing that man keep taking those kids out get your wife out there and just celebrate life it's worth celebrating luke yeah absolutely she we did our first backpacking trip in steamboat this summer me and my wife so she uh she loved it right on Right on. Yep. Well, hey, man, thank you so much for your time today to share your story with us. It's encouraging to me, and it's going to be inspirational to others. Congrats on beating that cancer stuff and, and for getting out there and doing it. Absolutely. I, I appreciate it. And if anybody's listening that's going through it, don't give up. Keep your head up. Keep moving. You know, uh, you posted a bunch of pictures on Facebook, I'll bet, if people want to see some of this. Yeah, Absolutely. I think I'm on Facebook, Luke Moore, um, Cedar Falls, Iowa. Luke Moore, Cedar Falls. Right on. So if you want to go see some of the pictures about the trip and that kind of stuff, then you can find it there. And uh, so, Luke, I'm just going to say, man, it's been awesome talking to you. And for all of our listeners out there, 
you know, we're out of time. I'd love to talk to Luke all day, but until the next show, dream big, reach for something, and get out there and have some fun. Coming up on Thursday, we'll have Liam Kirkham on to talk about his solo journey paddling the Grand Canyon. Until then, get out and have some fun. Why don't you do yourself and us a favor and become a member of our Facebook group. In there, you can hear about some awesome adventures, learn how to do new ones, and share what you've been up to. And while you're on the web, do us a favor and go over to patreon.com slash adventuresportspodcast and consider becoming a patron to help the show. You can also find a link to patron at the top of our website at adventuresportspodcast.com. As always, thanks for listening, guys.